good evening. Well, yeah, thank you very much for, for having me on. Let's put my slideshow from the beginning. Here we go. Okay. Um, it's probable that if you asked any member of the public uh, to name a Great War Army chaplain, that they'd probably come up with the name of Steady Kennedy. And remember, his nickname particularly Woodbine Willie. His remarkable fame during the war as an army chaplain and poet, and in the interwar years as a noted speaker and campaigner for industrial peace, and an author of popular theological books. This fame has lasted well into the 21st century. While many of his fellow wartime chaplains and his colleagues in the Industrial Christian Fellowship have faded into relative obscurity. Writing shortly after Geoffrey Studder Kennedy's death in 1929, William Temple, Archbishop of Canterbury, said of his contemporary, many of us regard him as one of God's greatest gifts to our generation. One of Studder Kennedy's friends, the Reverend J.K. Mosley, described his gifts as including those of prophet, priest and teacher. During this talk, um, I'll try and look at the claims of Temple and others in the context of the earliest 20th century, uh, concentrating mainly on his army career, uh, his career as an army chaplain, but also bearing in mind um, that his career post-war was relevant as we now moving on from the 100th centenary of the war to consideration of the implications of the war for the rest of the 20th century and indeed the 21st century. From an early age, Geoffrey Studder Kennedy had a preoccupation with the poor and underprivileged in society. He was the son of a priest in a poor parish of Leeds, and here we have it, St Mary's Church, Quarry Hill, Leeds, and was aware of their needs from an early age. In his choice for his curacies in rugby and Leeds, and his first living in Worcester, he chose to liberty to live and work among the poorer sections of society. The family had moved from York, uh, to Yorkshire from Ireland in 1898, and Sir Kennedy was brought up in happy, if noisy, vicarage, the 11th of 13 children. Uh, that was from two different wives. Um, the young Sir Kennedy was very engrossed in reading, and from a child, he was regarded as a bit of an eccentric by the rest of his family because he was very absent minded and forgetful. His usual excuse for absent-mindedness was that he was thinking about something entirely different, one that I often use myself. He was educated at Leeds Grammar School and Trinity College Dublin, and he then attended Ripon College for his ordination training, uh, being ordained in 1908. In his first curacy at um, St Andrew's Church Rugby, shown here, he rapidly gained a reputation again for eccentricity, but also a bias to the poor and some excellent preaching. Now, his preaching was sometimes too modern and shocking for the congregation of St Andrew's, and his vicar, A.V. Bailey, a, a real old Victorian style vicar, uh, requested to, him, to contain himself to just one heresy a week, if you wouldn't mind. He did much of his pastoral work in the pubs, talking to working men, being successful in building up a rapport with them. He was comfortable visiting the poor areas, singing in pubs, wearing his cassock, and having long conversations in people's kitchens and sitting in the kitchen smoking or attending the sick bed. After a brief spell as his father's curate back in Leeds, he married Emily Catlow in April 1914, and he was inducted into his first living in the parish of St Paul's Worcester on the 9th of June 1914. Um, parts of the parish of St Paul's were poor and deprived, and Steady Kennedy, as usual, turns much of his attention to work with the children in the parish and the poor. He continued his rather reckless distribution of his personal possessions to those he thought needed them. His long-suffering wife was once required to help him carry their bed bit by bit to a sick parishioner. And before his marriage, um, he had a landlady who had given him a, a really nice coat because she didn't appear to have a coat. And she was very cross because almost immediately he gave it away to, to a tramp who didn't have a coat at all. Not long after he arrived in his new parish, war broke out. The war received a mixed reaction from the clergy of the church in England. Bishop Gore of Oxford uh, described his feelings about the war. He said, it cometh of the evil one. The Archbishop of York, Cosmo Gordon Lang said, 
I hate law. It is the bankruptcy of Christian principle. However, Gore soon adopted the position described by his biographer that, quote, no other course lay open to the country than to participate. Sir Kennedy was enthusiastic about war. He said, I can't say too strongly that I believe every able-bodied man ought to volunteer for service anywhere. There ought to be no shirking of that duty. Those who cannot volunteer can pray. And now, it must be remembered that um, in this attitude, uh, to the outbreak of war was that one, was one of the majority, even among the clergy of the Anglican Church. As an avid reader of history and theology, Sir Kennedy would have been aware of the links between nationalism and religion, which had been established in the 19th century, particularly in Germany. Nationalism had often become to be seen as an essential part of Christianity. Some insight into Sir Kennedy's thinking at the beginning of the war albeit written in hindsight, may be gained by some passages from Democracy in the Dog Collar, a book he wrote in the post-war era. And he said this, when I went into my study in August 1914 to decide what I, as a Christian minister, was to do about this business, I went into one of those horrible hours of my life. I believed then, as I believe now, only not so clearly or completely, that war was a disaster. I decided to play my part in the war rather than protest against it because I believed that disastrous as it was, it was forced upon us. And if we refused to accept the challenge, a greater and a more awful disaster would fall upon us, not merely as a nation, but upon the world as a whole. However, he couldn't just desert his parish and most off to war. He had to make arrangements for the pastoral uh, care and the practical care of his parish um, while he was away. He had in common with all Anglican ca uh, candidates for army chaplaincy an interview um, with Bishop Taylor Smith, who was the chaplain general. And the record card of his interview, consisting of some hastily written notes by Bishop Taylor Smith, informs us that the interview took place on the 9th of December, 1915. Stead Kennedy was classed as a fit, able to start immediately, and had a preference for overseas work. His style of preaching was described as extempore. And in the section for the Chaplain General's remarks, Taylor Smith had written humour A1. Eventually, he made arrangements for the pastoral and spiritual care of his parish and was deployed. The first part of his career was over, and I think it can be seen that both his success in appealing to men at the front and his battle for a more equal society in the post-war years did actually have their roots in this parochial ministry before the war. Like many of the chaplains, his work in parishes and clubs in deprived areas and parishes had prepared him for close contact with men from all backgrounds. So, on the 21st of December 1915, he found himself over the Channel and in a French village, and on Christmas Day. He described his first service, his congregation with 400 men lined up in the rain. I hurried into my robes, he said, and went to the middle of the square. There was, of course, no instrument, but I thanked God for a voice like a foghorn. But once we had started, oh, come all ye faithful, no instruments and no leading voice were necessary. They sang with all their might, and then the glorious part came. I went into a shed in the farmyard, and the communicants came to me. There were not many, but they meant it. It was wonderful. No lights, no ritual, nothing to help but the rain and the far-off roll of the drums, and Christ was born in the cattle shed on Christmas Day. Um, I'd like here just to explain a little bit about the way in the chaplain's role had been developing on the Western Front um, prior to Study Kennedy's experience, to put it in context. When the first temporary chaplains of the forces arrived on the Western Front in 1914 and into 1915, very little thought seems to have gone to, into their role. Throughout 1915, the temporary chaplains were experiencing the development of trench warfare on the Western Front, and, and they were trying to establish a role for themselves. Their mobilisation had been somewhat chaotic, with no provisions in the mobilisation plan for their attachment, rations or transport. Peter Housen's work on the organisational structure of the chaplain's department in the First War is called Muddling Through. 
and he considers this to be an apt title for the experience of those first chaplains deployed in France. The historian Roger Lloyd commented on the chaplain's task. He said, he could indeed become necessary, but he must create that necessity himself. Were they purveyors of holy grocery, expending their energies on providing material comfort and recreation for the troops? Or was their main role always to care for the spiritual needs of the men and the officers? Was their place behind the lines taking services at base camps and hospitals? With the field ambulance giving spiritual succor and medical assistance? Or were they meant to be in the front line? At the outset, the army commanders developed a policy of not allowing chaplains in the front line. And when E.C. Cross, an Anglican padre, arrived in France in September 1915, he was told in no uncertain terms that he was absolutely forbidden by his senior chaplain from venturing into the front line. It was thought that the chaplains would be in the way and serve no useful purpose. Now, these orders were often disregarded, especially by Roman Catholic chaplains who had a theological imperative of administering the sacraments of Holy Communion or the last rites to dying men. This led to a perception, which was encouraged by authors Siegfried Sassoon and Robert Graves, that Roman Catholic chaplains were actually of more use. Uh, however, actual contemporary criticism of chaplains rested more on the dislike of church parades and the perceived scarcity of chaplains. This situation changed when pressure from the chaplains and a gradual realisation by army commanders that chaplains were good for morale gradually led to the chaplains being allowed greater freedom of movement. This resulted in the chaplains, many chaplains, being able to make themselves useful on the front line. For example, um, by bringing in wounded, an activity for which chaplains were awarded medals for. Anglican chaplains alone were awarded 37 distinguished service orders and 250 military crosses. At frontline aid posts and dressing stations, chaplains helped in medical and practical ways, involving perhaps bandages and perhaps cups of tea. But their primary purpose was to be with the wounded and dying, praying and comforting them, or often just sitting with them. Uh, here we can see a task that they, they often did at these, uh, in the front line, uh, writing home for the men, which was very much appreci appreciated. An important part of their work was, of course, burials, often under fire, and also taking services. The forming of a role for chaplains in the front was a real learning curve. And here we have um, a, a picture of a church parade, which was compulsory and formal, and they were disliked by the men because of the necessity for inspection and to be spick and span. Many chaplains, well, most chaplains were not in favour of too many church parades and preferred to arrange voluntary services. And also on this slide, you can see a much more informal arrangement uh, for a service before battle rather than them forming up in squares, as you can see for the church parade. So, Studder Kennedy arrived at the front at a time when temporary chaplains were finding a role. He was then sent to a large army base at Rouen. Rouen had become a major supply base with numerous hospitals and the third echelon general headquarters was established there. It was also one of the muster points for troops to go up to the front line. Senior chaplain Carey, hearing about Studded Kennedy's experiences of outdoor preaching in rugby and Leeds, decided to send him to the railway sidings, a sort of baptism of fire to minister as best he could to the soldiers who were awaiting trains up the front. Each afternoon, they congregated in a large railway shed called by the troops, the Rouen Station Coffee Shop. Stella Kennedy saw as it is tasked to offer friendship, material comfort and prayer for the troops gathered in the sidings, awaiting nervously the trip up to the front lines. As many as 1,000 men could be gathered at the station. For many, this would be their first taste of battle. Each day, he would go to the men at the canteen mix with them, chat with them, and when he felt the time was right, he would mount a box and sing the popular songs of the time. Accompanied sometimes by the canteen piano, he catered for all the men in his audience by singing Mother McCree for the sons, Little Grey Home in the West for the husbands, and The Sunshine of Your Smile for the lovers. Carey, the senior chaplain, commented, 
commented that after the singing, Studded Kennedy, quote, had them in his pocket. Having captured their attention, he then gave a short religious talk and offered to write home to their families, assuring them that they were in the pink. When it was time to entrain, Studded Kennedy went up and down the train, distributing New Testaments and cigarettes. Train always stayed an hour at the sounding sightings and at the end of that time he was left standing looking at the departing train with his thoughts. He said there's nothing glorious about this departure except the glory of their patience and determination. It is all sordid and filthy. The distribution of the cigarettes drew on might have been the genesis of his nickname Woodbine Willie as thousands of troops must have passed through Rouen. On the publication of, of my of, of publication of my book, um, the papers took up this this uh, thing about Woodbine Willie and the cigarettes, and they published some articles um, about this aspect of his work. In response to their questions, I did some rough calculations and came up with some figures regarding his cigarette handouts. Based on some figures concerning his wages, the price of Woodbines, and the number of men I calculated that he might have seen. I calculated that he given out a, could have given out a total of 864, 980 Woodbine cigarettes. Now, don't ask me how I did this. This is a few years ago. I can't remember. Um, I don't think it was highly mathematical. And I'm sure it wasn't very accurate, uh, but that's the angle the papers wanted to take. And it, it sort of made it a, a good story. However, to be serious, Studder Kennedy didn't really like his nickname, as can be seen by his poem, Woodbine Willie. This is a quote from it. They gave me this name like their nature, compacted of laughter and tears, a joke that was born of the bitter, a joke that was born from the years. And the poem finishes, for the men to whom I, own, I owed God's peace, I put off with a cigarette. In the evenings at Rouen, after his work in the sidings, Stella Kennedy gave a series of talks at the Hotel de Ville. From his letters home, it would seem that these talks grew in popularity as Lent progressed, and he felt they'd been a success. The climax being on Good Friday evening, when the talk went well. He said, when it was over, they sat for a while. I'm sure that Christ was with us and was glad. Then they cheered, and their cheer was an answer to the call of Christ. Some may forget it, but surely not all. The Lenten Talks, plus two additional ones, were published in Rough Talks by a Padre in early 1918. From these talks, we get an idea of his opinions at this stage in the war. The talks all started with the questions which must have been on the lips of many soldiers. The first one was entitled, What are we fighting for? Study Kennedy took a tour of German history, beginning with the remark, the Germany of Kant and Christianity became the Germany of Krupp and Kultur. Now, this talk has been criticised for its jingoistic tone. However, revisionist historians such as Dan Todman and Gary Sheffield have argued against this all-pervasive myth that the First World War um, uh, was a disaster caused by incompetent politicians or greedy industrialists. Todman comments, quote, the war is not, not now seen as a fight about nothing, but as a war about ideals a struggle between aggressive militarism and more or less liberal democracy. In his second talk, Study Kennedy identified in an uncompromising manner the link in his mind between the British cause and God's will. He said, you asked me what we are fighting for. I give it to you in three words, freedom, honour, peace. You asked me what we are fighting for you for. I give it to you in one word, Christ. We must remember, however, that his audience were young soldiers hungry for reassurance that the horror in which they found themselves had meaning. One of his early poems was included in his talk in the published version, and it ended, that the kids will someday bless us when they grow up British men, because we tamed the Prussian tyrant and brought peace to earth again. Now, it's also important, with a bit of balance, to note that in these rough talks, that Kennedy criticised not only the Germans, but also the state of Britain, pre-war Britain, and uh, the pre-war church. In one of his talks, Stella Kennedy explained his view of God as a suffering God, a view that had developed in his pre-war studies, and continued to develop as he experienced more and more of the horrors of war. God is not distant and omnipotent, but shares in our sufferings, he said, as he suffered on the cross. 
This is not mainstream theology at the time, but became better known. Reinhold Niebuhr and Diedrich Bonhoeffer took up this idea um, after and during the Second World War. The last talk on Good Friday 1916 was impressive, with Studdy Kennedy being cheered to the rafters. So in June, Studdy Kennedy, having saved a kind of apprenticeship at Rouen, joined the 137th Brigade, Staffordshire Brigade, with the 46th Division. He was just in time to join them for the preparations for the Battle of the Somme. The 46th Division were to be involved in a diversionary attack at Gormcourt and Fonconvillier. This was his chance at last to be in the front line for a major action. The work of the division or chaplain near the front line consisted of helping at the regimental aid posts, leading stretcher bearing parties, locating the dead and making a careful note of their position if it was not possible to bring them in. Reverend E.C. Cross, also on the Somme at this time, asserted the significance of the chaplain's presence near the front line. They alone, he said, were not under orders to be there and as such could not fail to encourage the rest who had no option in the matter. On arriving at his unit, he realised that some men were to go from their billets to dig a kick-off trench, and this was likely to be a rotten job. So the Kennedy decided to accompany him. The regimental history of the Staffordshire's decided the digging of a jumping-off trench two nights just before the attack. All went well on the first night, with covering parties followed by working parties who were to construct the trench. The work had to be completed the next night, and this time was not so successful. Heavy rain had fallen, which made the trenches waist deep in water, and the regimental uh, history says no useful work could be done. The German artillery had managed to get an accurate range on the new trench, and at 12.20 the enemy guns opened on our working parties. Stead of Kennedy was helped by a, bur by a burly sergeant, <laughs> uh, but then they both took a decking. Stead of Kennedy remembered fear came. He said, there was a pain beneath the belt. Of course, I had to go. We crept out. It was then that the sergeant, albeit obliquely, questioned Stead of Kennedy's presence, saying, this ain't exactly what you call a bloody mother's meeting, is it, sir? and making progress across the flooded trench crowded with men was slow. Studied Kennedy remembered, I whispered some inane remarks as I passed by and was rewarded all along the line with a grin and often when I passed with a muttered comment, go blind me if it ain't the parson. Vaguely, I felt that the journey was worthwhile. Just after the attack at Goncourt, on July 1916, the Reverend William Drury ran into Steady Kennedy at Fonkwood Villiers and accompanied him on some visits to forward posts. He was impressed by Steady Kennedy's belief that the Padre should make a point of seeking out the dangerous spots to counteract the idea that being a chaplain was a soft job. Later, Drury was to encounter Steady Kennedy at the chaplain's school at St. Omer, which was actually called the chaplain's bomber school. Um, and he remembered, <laughs> At Sitomba, he urged his chaplains to seek the most dangerous positions as our presence was the best expression we could give of our message to the troops. In his book, The Hardest Part, Stedder Kennedy gave a series of Camus' life in the front, which led him on to his developing ideas about theology and the suffering God. They also give us a good idea of the difficulties and dangers of his life and the extent to which he identified with the men and did everything he could to help them. The poem, My Mate, sums up much of these thoughts and ideas. Then there spoke a dripping sergeant when the time was growing late. Would you please bury this one? Because he used to be my mate. So we groped our way in darkness to a body lying there, just a blacker lump of blackness with a red blotch on his hair. Though we turned him gently over, yet I still can hear the thud as the body fell face forward and settled in the mud. Uh, we, went up, we went down upon our faces and I said the service through from I am the resurrection to the last, the great adieu. We stood up to give the blessings and commend him to the Lord when a sudden light shot soaring, silver swift and like a sword. At a stroke it slew the darkness, flashed its glory on the mud and I saw the sergeant staring at the crimson clot of blood. There are many kinds of sorrow in this world of love and hate. But there is no sterner sorrow than a soldier's for his mate. 
I, I chose that poem because I think, you know, of all the poems that I could have, could have, and there are many poems I could have used, that really sums up the way that his empathy um, uh, with the thoughts of the soldiers. Um, when a new padre, who was later to become very famous, and here he is, the Reverend T.B. Bailey Hardy, DSOVC, um, he asked for advice on his task as an army chaplain, and a senior chaplain recommended to Bailey that he had a conversation with a certain Mr. Studded Kennedy. The chaplains, who had to become two of the most famous in the Great War, met for an hour in Carey's office. According to a letter to Mary Bailey from Studded Kennedy, Bailey said very little, but listened avidly to what his fellow padre had to say. A letter to Mary from Studder Kennedy gives us a good idea of his philosophy on chaplaincy, was to have a very important effect on Hardy. I said, live with the men, go everywhere they go, make up your mind that you will share all their risks uh, and more if you can do any good. You can take it that the best place for a padre, provided he does not interfere with military operations, is where there is a danger of death. Work in the front and they will listen to you when they come out to rest. But if you only preach and teach behind, you're wasting your time. The men won't pay the slightest attention to you. The men will forgive you for anything but lack of courage and devotion. With that, you're useless. Hardy then asked him about spiritual work and in an honest answer, Steder Kennedy replied, There's very little spiritual work. It is all muddled and mixed, but it is spiritual. Take a box of fags in your haversack and a great deal of love in your heart and go up to them, joke with them. You can pray with them sometimes, but pray for them always. It's when he was preaching at the base camp that he started writing poems written in the language of the ordinary soldier. The senior chaplain, the Reverend McNutt, was so impressed with one of the first ballads, Sinner and Saint, a Sermon in a Billet, that he learned it by heart overnight and recited it to troops he met. In another, The Sorrow of God, um, he explained simply that the narrator explained his views of a suffering God, said, The sorrows of God must be hard to bear if he really has love in his heart, and the hardest part in the world to play must surely be God's part. He also published two volumes of Rough Rhymes of a Padre, which collected his poems written in the front, and these sold like hot cakes, reaching sales reaching 70,000. The verse made an important contribution to his popularity at the time. He used it as a vehicle for his basic themes, and they actually reached many who would not have read his other books. The poems touched on difficult yet essential aspects of death, judgment, atonement, and a suffering God in a very accessible way. Um, one concerns the production, predictions of a dismal gym padre on death and judgment, and these are rejected by the soldier who narrates the poem. Somehow, I can't think it's right. It ain't what God would do. This tale of those, all those record books, I think it's all Napu. In a vivid dream experienced by him, when he's unable to see all the wrongs in his life, and is offered the opportunity to put them right. The narrator is convinced of the possibility of redemption and of its personal nature. He says, there ain't no throne and there ain't no books. It's him that is the judge of blokes like you and me. And boys, I'd sooner frizzle up in the flaming burns of hell than stand and look into his face and hear his voice say, well, in June 1917, then, Steady Kennedy was released, released from preaching at base camps to join the 24th Division of Second Army in the attack of Messine by Shati Ridge. At 310, 19 underground mines were blown, and the 24th Division attacked in the second wave in the afternoon. During the battle, Steady Kennedy was occupied in bringing up the wounded, on one occasion, rang over the battlefield between hell sh shell holes to obtain some more morphia as supplies had run out. His action at Messines is best described by the citation for his military cross, which appeared in the London Gazette on the 16th of August, 1917. It said, for conspicuous gallantry and devotion to duty, he showed the greatest courage and disregard for his own safety in attending the wounded under heavy fire. He searched for shell holes on his own, for his own and enemy wounded, assisting them to the dressing station, 
and his cheerfulness and endurance had a splendid effect upon all ranks in the frontline trenches, which he constantly visited. During his time on the Western Front, Studder Kennedy frequently suffered from asthma attacks that he experienced since childhood, and he was unfit to be in the front line for long periods of time. He was taken out of the line to preach at base camps, but also to be chaplain at various infantry schools. In the gaps between his frontline service and his work preaching, he spent some time at the third, fourth and second infantry schools. These schools trained officers and NCOs to be unit instructors on things like Lewis guns, bomb, bombing, bombing, and sorry, Lewis guns, bombing, and bayonet fighting, and brought officers up to date with the latest tactics. It also gave them an opportunity of a short break from the trenches. Several hundred officers and NCOs would spend five weeks on such a course and were lectured on a variety of topics. Steve Kennedy had the opportunity to lecture and teach. He explained in a letter to parishioners that as, as many of these men, went, as many men went on a wide variety, came from a wide variety of battalions, there was a chance of spreading teaching widely. At the fourth infantry school, he was given the opportunity of training with the men and learning bayonet drill and also boxing with them. And he said, quote, after a man has had the exquisite pleasure of punching the parson's nose, he is more ready to hear him preach. It was while he was at the fourth infantry school that Studder Kennedy met Colonel R.B. Campbell, who was in charge of the school for physical and bayonet training at Hardilow. Campbell was impressed by a sermon that Studder Kennedy had preached to his men when he'd invited him at St. Paul. The sermon had grabbed the audience's attention by announcing, I know what you're thinking, here's the bloody parson, but then held their attention by explaining why blaspheming was actually wrong. The men struck up a friendship and Stilly Kennedy was invited to become chaplain of the school. Campbell reported, he had a wonderful effect on the men. He seemed to get the best out of them. He had a good influence on the men and my staff also, which was reflected in their work. Campbell would take Stilly Kennedy with a talk to convalescent troops, speaking to large numbers of men in the open or at canteens. It was at Campbell's school that Stilly Kennedy toured occasionally with what he referred to as the travelling circus. This was a disparate group which included Jimmy Driscoll, champion boxer, two champion wrestlers, and an NCO who was famous for his skill with the bayonet. They were morale boosting unit, and after the demonstrations by the heavies, that she would sometimes take part boxing against Driscoll, Study Kennedy would round off the proceedings with 20 minutes talk, which, according to Campbell, never failed to get a wonderful response from his audience, leaving them with their tails up and ready for battle. Purcell, a biographer of Stella Kennedy, says of this aspect of his work, he said, he seems at times to have allowed himself gladly to be used as a morale booster to an extent which would certainly have been regarded as improper in a chaplain of the Second War. However, it is difficult to comment on the evidence of one observer what exactly was said to make his listeners ready for battle. Philip Gibbs, a war correspondent, commented on the way that his role was to raise morale by finishing the entertainment by talking, as Gibbs put it, of God, war and the meaning of courage, which puts a slightly different aspect uh, to what he was saying. Much has been written and discussed about the question of the role of chaplains role in, in uh, warfare and their use as morale boosters or force multipliers and their ability to deal with this tension inherent in their role. Historian Stephen Loudon was vociferous in his condemnation, and Gordon Zahn, in his 1969 study of chaplaincy in the RAF, commented that, quote, by his very presence, the pastor in uniform represents a symbol of legitimacy. If it were not permissible for believers to take part in the war, would the priest be there? Recently, Andrew Totten, senior chaplain, has suggested that, quote, if the conduct of the fighting soldier were justified, why should the maintenance of his morale not be a proper object for concern? He defines the difference between morale, the psychosocial state, and moral, the ethical. Soldiers need to be at ease with their conscience and their moral sense is uh, to give their conscience and their moral sense to have a good morale. And part of the chaplain's job is to promote that sense of moral and ethical values. Totten continues, the challenge ethically is to generate morale that is grounded on civilised behaviour. 
After the war, Stella Kennedy seemed to have been aware of this unresolved tension in his wartime role and had an element of what his nephew Gerald Stella Kennedy called personal guilt about the war. Speaking in Central Hall, Westminster on Armistice Day 1921, he said, if they killed your husband, in Christ's name forgive. They were mad. I was mad, crazy. We got decorated for doing things that we did when we were mad. By the end of the war, then, Stella Kennedy had achieved some fame as a chaplain, poet and speaker. He returned via Folkestone on March 21st, 1919. He had become a national figure, but was now returning to his parish, changed like so many by the fortunes of war. Um, this is the War Memorial at Worcester St Paul's and uh, Stella Kennedy had a part in designing it because he wanted to have the figure of Christ with his head up looking up triumphant rather than uh, triumphant in victory rather than bowed. However, it soon became apparent that Stella Kennedy could not keep up the work of a full-time parish priest and fulfil his increasing fame and speaking commitments. Making a full-time worker for the Industrial Christian Fellowship, becoming their lead missioner, going around the country speaking uh, going around the country speaking and taking part in the proper popular ICF crusades, mainly in industrial parts of Britain. The ICF was a response to the revelations of alienation and secularization which had been seen in the war. Its motto was Christ the Lord of all life had aimed to improve relations between labour and owners by bringing growth to an allegiance to Christ. One of his themes at ICF meetings and crusades was, quote, that the primacy of Christ in industrial affairs will solve problems that neither capitalism or socialism can deal with. Like many of his wartime, like many of his wartime colleagues, Studdard Kennedy was involved with remembrance of the dead on a determination that should be best remembered by the creation of a more equal society. He also did a lot of work with veterans associations. He caused some controversy with his book Lies, which was an impassioned plea for a fairer society and expressed the development of his thought into pacifism on his return to civilian life. This was matched by a deep commitment and compassion for those who had suffered as a result of war. This was expressed in one of his post-war poems, The Pensioner. The narrator, a wife, describes a pre-war romance and a marriage and then the return of her husband. Lucky what the war's done at him, lying there still as death. See his mouth all screwed and twisted with the pain of drawing breath. She reflected that she should be grateful to have a pension, but my pension won't buy kisses and he'll never kiss again. Much of Study Kennedy's success as an army chaplain and his fame in the post-war years arose from us, as we've seen from his preaching, preaching and speaking ability. He preached in many churches around the country and spoke on many platforms from 1919 to 29, uh, from preaching to the king as royal chaplain to the open air crusades. He never became a fashionable preacher and indeed had his detractors who criticised his racy language and his accent but many thousands of people from all walks of life heard his message. He spoke on the economic situation, pacifism, politics, the Christian life and topical subjects such as birth control and the application of psychology to everyday life. The post-war years also saw his reputation as an author and poet grow. Many of his poems were not in the rough rhyme vernacular style and have been considered to be a creditable addition to 20th century poetry for example, his book, The Unutterable Beauty, collection of poems published in 1927, which I remember seeing on my father's bookshelves as a child. Although many of his books are now not read and his poems have fallen out of fashion, he was actually a bestseller of his time. His wartime prose and poetry continued to be popular and were joined by the books Lies and Democracy and the Dog Collar, which both tackled the problems of the gospel in the marketplace and in the factories and public halls of Britain. A review of Lies remarked, plunge a man with the soul of a priest and the heart of a poet into the horror that was Flanders and something amazing must be the result. Stuart Kennedy had suffered from asthma all his life and he was a chain smoker. In addition, he was wearing his somewhat frail body out by his constant traveling around the country, speaking for the Industrial Christian Fellowship. 
In March 1929, he was taken ill with influenza in Liverpool and died in March the 8th, that, March the 8th of that year. His popularity was shown by the mass mourning of the service in Liverpool and the working men had requested that this service be at a time where they could attend. And the service then, the, the, the cortege went to Worcester Cathedral and was preceded by a cortege procession around the town. The veterans laid a packet of woodbine on the coffin, a tribute to his handing out of cigarettes. A report in a report, there's his funeral. Um, a report in the Yorkshire Times speculated on the reasons why Steady Kennedy was so popular and why some army chaplains were not, and concluded. If we could find a reason why, we might well be on the way to discover how the churches might recover the influence they have, had, they have to a large extent lost. The report reached the conclusion that one of the reasons was that, so far as Woodbine Willie is concerned, he took big views, he used plain language, and he could enter into the minds of men. In a tribute to Steady Kennedy in the Times in 1929, Dick Shepherd mentioned this early criticism of Steady Kennedy. At one time, it was the fashion in certain conventional circles to criticise Stedder Kennedy and to suggest that his language, at least in the pul pulpit, was too colloquial. But for some, now, for some years now, it has been, I think, generally recognised that Christianity has had no more powerful or effective advocate. A memorial plaque was put up in Worcester Cathedral, inscribed, Geoffrey Ancatel Stedder Kennedy, MC, a poet, a prophet, a passionate seeker after truth, an ardent advocate of Christian fellowship, chaplain to His Majesty the King George V, chaplain to the forces, rector of St Edmund King and Martyr in the City of London, sometime vicar of St Paul's in this city, born 27th of June 1883, died 8th of March 1929. An assessment of Study Kennedy's personality is difficult as he left very very few personal papers. It's clear from personal accounts that he had an ability to relate intensely to people in a pastoral and personal situation, but also to make every person in a crowd feel that they were being individually addressed. The scenes of his funeral 11 years after the war bear witness to the affection he was held in by veterans and his ability to relate to soldiers in the war. But it must be remembered that Study Kennedy was only one of many chaplains serving in the Great War. By 1918, there had been over 3,000 serving. And, and he has, because in some ways, because of his post-war fame, become symbolic of the many chaplains that they were doing their best to minister to their men in the maelstrom of total war, which had never been experienced before. Recent research has shown that the reputation of chaplains engendered by the post-war war books boom in the late 20s and 30s, and that the criticisms based on studies of military, mala military morale in the 1980s have not provided a balanced picture of military chaplaincy. While Study Kennedy has been a famous symbol of the way in which a good chaplain to make a difference, his work was replicated by many courageous and hard-working chaplains. Although considered, although often considered as both an eccentric and a controversial character, both in war and peace, I personally think he can lay claim to have been a successful wartime padre and a role model for other padres. His poetry was vastly popular as it struck a chord to the ordinary soldier. His theological and political ideas were in many ways prophetic. Study Kennedy, although working himself literally to death, was most self-critical and sometimes oblivious to the effect he had on people. I think it would be appropriate to finish with one of his last poems. So, it is not finished, Lord. There is not one thing done. There is no battle of my life that I have really won. But he is content to put his life as work into God's hands and finishes. I have no strength for more, so it must stand or fall. Dear Lord, that's all. Um, that is all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, and uh, your timing was uh, spot on. You said three quarters an hour. And, and, uh, yeah, spot on, yes. <laughs> Well done indeed. Uh, it, it, it in the, the, that's on the, on, the, on the nose with the timing. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, if you'd like to raise your hands as the normal tradition uh, 
dictates as as a uh, alternative to the real life round of applause we've got absolutely everybody's hands going up there so that's tremendous thanks very much indeed you can all lower your hands again thanks a lot um okay we've got see uh, the hands <laughs> you, you can't you can't see the hands i, I can't I, see I, the I, hands I, 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 there's a little control panel on the bottom and I, oh, I, right. I, I can see hands going up and hands going down. So thanks for that, everybody. Um, yeah, brilliant. Um, okay, now's the time to, to type in the questions and it just takes a, a moment or two for them to, to come through. So let me just, um, uh, I, I, perhaps I can just ask one uh, in, in, straight away just while people are typing the questions in. There was a reference there to his accent. Um, would that be a Yorkshire accent? No, was... sorry, I, I didn't make that clear. Um, he always he, he spoke with an Irish accent and people thought that he was putting it on, I think, just for effect. But actually, when you think he was brought up in a house with an Irish mother, an Irish father, and lots of older brothers and sisters, yeah. who, uh, you know, back and forth to Ireland, then it's explainable. But, um, I mean, maybe he did exaggerate it a bit, you know, as people with regional accents sometimes do. But, um uh, yeah, he was criticised. People thought it was a bit, but I think it was genuine myself. Yeah, sure enough. So thanks for I've got questions coming in now. So I've got a question here from somebody who hasn't got a webcam or mic. Um, so this is from Andrew Johnson. Uh, Andrew asks, uh, stood at Kennedy and other chaplains I know are remembered as uh, loved by their men. Are there any examples of chaplains who were despised by their men? All oh, right. Well, um, I haven't come across any specific examples, but I am sure that uh, uh, as regards with all the men, there were some chaplains that were really not liked. Um, there were some chaplains who men considered were a bit la -di da you know, and a bit sort of too uh, upper class for, the, for, for their role, um, but not specific examples. Um, there was a, a novel written by um, a chap called Arif Benson in the 30s that talked about a chaplain in um, called Retreat that talked about a chaplain um, in the 1918 retreat that um, was a coward on the book, you know, really sort of took him apart. But that was sort of answered by Tubby Clayton with a letter in the Telegraph saying this is rubbish, you know, you wouldn't have a, a chaplain like that. So the short answer is I'm sure that there, there were chaplains like there are vicars now who are not liked by their parishioners. Um, but I think that uh, the most of the evidence that I have got uh, does say that they, they were they they were held in respect and were loved and did a good job. Super, thanks for that. Right, we've just got a few uh, folk now lined up, so that's brilliant. Judith, uh, Judith Reese, uh, you're now live. Um, Hello, Judith. On, on the audio. Hello. Um, so, um, fire away with your question, please, Judith. Yes, hello, nice, nice, oh, excuse me, nice to see you again. I was really, really interested in your, your presentation tonight, and it held a lot of similarities for me with a nonconformist style of preaching. And I wonder, I've read very little about his relationship with the, in particular, the free churches. I wonder if you have anything on that, whether he did have any ecumenical. Um, cooperations on the front. Yeah, well, at the, on, 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 actually on the Western Front, uh, that was a sort of um, a bit of a learning curve for ecumenical matters as well. Um, and particularly, uh, not so much with perhaps with Roman Catholics, because Roman Catholics obviously wouldn't have communion services with, um, uh, with other denominations, but with free churches and nonconformists, as the war went on, they certainly uh, had services together. Um, and I think uh, I've read that um, sometimes, you know, the nonconformist uh, uh, Padre would do the cup and the communion and it was a, a definite learning curve and when they came back after the war then that of course was the basis of growing ecumenical um, adventures in the um, you know in the interwar years but the Anglican church being a bit stuffy uh, didn't like Dick Shepherd wanted to have communion with all uh, you know with all comers and I think he probably did but um, uh, and Tubby Clayton the same, but it took a long time to get that way. And of course, with the Industrial Christian Fellowship, he was with all kinds of denominations, yeah. uh, and it was often the nonconformist people that would arrange the Crusades. Does I didn't that, know that. Does that, does that answer? Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much for the question, Judith. Right, so um, let me just have a look there. Edward, Edward Green, um, just unmuting you there, Edward. Um, 
you're, you're live. Do you want to fire a question? Okay. Uh, Linda, thank you very much for that. Um, there was a correspondence in the Times about three years ago about Studdett Kennedy, and um, there was a letter suggesting uh, someone who's brought up by a, a chap, uh, a, an army, um, uh, by a, a, a vicar in the Second World War, who told him that Studdard Kennedy and Tubby Clayton defended soldiers at courts martial accused of cowardice um, because fighting officers were not allowed to do so. Um, two questions. One is, did they defend soldiers at courts martial? And secondly, was there any kind of ban on fighting officers defending soldiers uh, accused of cowardice? Right, well, I've been spent many years since 2009 researching chaplains. And I must say I have never come across them being involved in court martials. That is not to say that I might have missed it, but I, I have never come across it. It, it was um, completely, I, I thought it was very odd, that's why I asked the question. Yes, um, I'm, I, I don't know about the other thing. I, I'm sorry, I don't know whether, whether, whether fighting officers were allowed to do that. Um, Perhaps David might be able to, because it was the court martial's uh, court martial occasion last uh, week. I'm, uh, so, so slightly out of focus there from oh, the. Sorry, just, just, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm no expert on court martials. Uh, no, no. To, to uh, done it on, on Monday, so uh, total pass on that. Sorry. No, sorry, I, I've got to pass on that one as well. But I'm sure that if I'd been, because you know, I've read quite a lot about them like, looking after men. And, uh, you know, and spending, spending the, the night before the court martial saying prayers with them and things like that, and actually going with them to execution. But I've never heard of them uh, being involved in court martial. The probably yeah, somebody. I, I was very doubtful about the whole letter, which is why, mm. <laughs> why I asked you about it. Probably but, someone will email me this week and say, oh, yes, you know, you were wrong about that, but I don't think so. Yeah. Thanks for that. Thanks, thanks for that to Edwin as well. Right, OK. Tim, um, Tim Walton. Um, just unmute yourself there, Tim. Here we are. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you for a very, very interesting talk. Um, what I would like to ask, you mentioned that Studdard uh, got married. Um, mm -hmm. His wife must have had a very lonely life. Did his marriage survive? And if so, did he have any children? Yes, um, he had. Yes, he must have been lonely because he was away for quite a lot of the war, and then he spent a lot of the interwar years zooming around the country on trains. Um, he did, however, I, um, can, uh, he did, however, make every effort to return. And there's a story about him going on a train in the middle of the night to get back to house for the for the birthday of one of his three sons. He had three sons. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. So. Um, yeah, I've never come across, from all I've read, it seems to have been um, a very strong, strong marriage indeed. I think that Mrs. Studdard Kennedy was quite a formidable woman. So, um, you know, perhaps she, she, she stood it quite well. Uh, but no, I haven't come across any, um, not even sort of any um, strains of, um, you know, of grumbling or anything. I think she was fully behind him on his uh, work. But he did, however, as I said, make a, a lot of efforts to remember birthdays and come back. Oh, and he brought her flowers. He did bring her flowers. Quite a few. Oh, it's a good, oh, it's a good thing, I think. <laughs> he did bring her flowers. Thank um, you. Yeah. Thanks for that. Thanks for your question, Martin. Um, Paul Colburn. Um... Hi, Linda. Uh, thanks for that. Very interesting. Oh, um, <laughs> I, 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 I live in rugby and was unaware of the connection to the town. All oh, right. Um, do you know if he, he spent any time uh, at rugby school or any involvement with rugby school or was he concentrating solely on the other end of the spectrum in the town? Ah, I'm desperately trying to think of this and um, I, think, I think he did, but I can't remember the details. I'm trying, trying to think now. Uh, whether it was there or whether it was whether it was Worcester or whether it was no no he did he did that's right they came they, yeah you remind me now they did come to services and he had friendships with some of them you know discussing things yes gosh you know I'd forgotten all about that thank you very much yes okay thank um, you yeah. thanks for that thanks Paul Christopher hi oh. hello hi. go for it hi thanks hello Linda thanks very much for that like a lot of people, um, walking around Commonwealth War Grave Cemeteries and seeing Padre's gravestones, uh, I've noticed a lot of them are Class 4. Could you please explain what this ranking system for Padre's was? Right. Um, if you, you went in as a captain, 
All right, commissioned officer, chaplain as a captain, and a captain was class four. And most chaplains were actually class four, <laughs> which is probably why you've seen so many class fours on the gravestones. Um, but then if you went, if you became a senior chaplain, divisional chaplain, you know, became class three. And then if you were, uh, if you if you got right to the top of the tree and um, uh, with a chaplain general, you were class one. But the vast majority of them were at the rank of captain and um, were chaplain fourth class. Fine, thank you very much for that. That's. At last, I've got the answer to my question. When you feel to, yes. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Marie, um, I'm just unmuting you there. Fire away, Marie. It was excellent. Thank you very much. Enjoyed it immensely. I wonder, could you tell me a bit more about Donald's connection with Ireland and who were his parents? And did you mention something about Cork, County Cork? Um, I didn't. Um, just to rewind, to, rewind to that. You're really stretching my memory now to go back to um, his father uh, was a vicar in Dublin, near Dublin, in a parish near Dublin. And the name of the parish now escapes me. I should have perhaps yes. tried to remember this before um, uh, before I came on. Um, he was a, a, a vicar there. Um, and he was married to his first wife. Where, oh, he was married to his first wife there, and they had six or seven children before he decided to move to Yorkshire. Now, I've thought about why he decided to move to, to, to Yorkshire. There's never anything being very explicit about it, uh, but I think it was probably because of the political and religious um, political and religious things going on in Ireland at the time. He decided to come and make a clean a clean break. Yes. Um, his children, his three of his sons. Uh, and uh, Stella Kennedy himself went back as external students to Trinity College Dublin and went back there. So there was, and, and Stella Kennedy went back to uh, visit his family there a lot. Um, I don't know whether you were um, listening when I said to David about his accent. Yes. Um, yes, how, you know, he, he always had an Irish accent, uh, you know, which he, he didn't get rid of, even though he was born in, in Yorkshire. Um, uh, what else would you like to know? Let's see if you can stimulate my memory on his Irish. <laughs> who, who was his, his mother? I, I didn't catch that. Um, I don't think I said, and I can't remember her name now. Um, this is really annoying. I can't, I was trying to, because I was, because I was concentrating on, on his, you know, his wartime yes. thing. I didn't actually yes. go back. But yes. if you'd like to, um, if you'd like to, to give me an email, then I can give you chapter and verse on the whole family and the whole history of, of the you. island. I just can't remember. Thank you very much. This. Thank <laughs> you very much. Yeah, yeah it's, very, it's, it's, it's very important though. I mean, I think throughout, yes. throughout the book, you know, it's, this, this Irish background is obviously yes. very, very important yes. to him. And it wasn't uncommon because I have come across um, an Irish girl whose father was a vicar in County Cork and that family returned as well because of what was happening in Ireland at the time and a lot of the churches were shut down and he yeah. that family moved back to Yorkshire as well. Yeah oh that's very interesting because that sort of chimes in with what I'd sort of been thinking to myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah I think it might have been happening more than um, it just to oneself and that girl was Flora Sens. Right. And okay. Well, that's very interesting. Thank you very much. Family were living in Cork, and I have visited the church where her father was a vicar, and they were living in Sunday as well. They were, I think, in Ireland. She was born in Yorkshire, but there were about seven or eight in the family, and most of those were born in County Cork. And oh, suddenly, right. they all went. Oh, a lot been of been the been churches been. were shut down. Smaller churches. So that's interesting. It just rang a bell with me. To, you it know, does, this that, similar. Said, you know, it chimes in what I'd, what I'd sort of thought to myself about the reasons for moving. Thank you very yes. much. Lovely. Thanks, Marie. Thanks very much for your question there. Um, I'm going to go to Simon Bull next, but I know Simon's just typed in to say he doesn't have a microphone, I believe. So um, I th that was a two questions from Simon. No, just one question. Simon, Simon Bull uh, asked, you said that church parades were compulsory. Were Quakers, atheists, Jews, etc., compelled to attend and did non-conformists have to attend C of E services? Um, yeah, I've not, yeah, I, yes, I think, I think they were because they were part, yes, they were part of the actual, um, 
military setup. It was an inspection, so they were required to be on parades. Now, I haven't ever come across, um, you know, I haven't ever come across any mention of them being absolved from this in any way. So I'm going with yes, I think, but I may be wrong. I'm going with that. Sorry, what was the second bit? Oh, crumbs, you've asked me now. <laughs> I have to move the question from one panel to another. Hang on, what, what was the second? Um, oh. You say, oh, this is it. Uh, with the compulsory, were Quakers, atheists, Jews, etc., compelled yeah. to attend and non confirmists have uh, to attend CAV services? And Alan Atkinson has actually asked a very sim similar question as well. Yeah. Uh, you might be able to combine this. Alan as far, asks, yeah. as have you, have you as... any work that you can tell us about regarding uh, Jewish chaplains? Right, okay. So uh, try and keep all that in my mind for a minute. As far as, as, far as services um, are concerned, um, you did, you had, you know, you've, you've first of all had, you know, your Anglican services with the Anglican Padre and your non-conformists, your, your non-conformists, your Roman Catholic, Roman Catholic. But as the war went on, there was a definitely, especially for voluntary services, not church parades, uh, for voluntary services, there was definitely a coming together, a lot of ecumenical, uh, you know, joining together, uh, not necessarily for communion services, but for, um, uh, for other kinds of services. So, um, Yes, you could have a service with your own padre, with your own denomination, but you could also, there was also plenty of opportunity to join in uh, with general services, which would be prayers and hymn singing, uh, rather than uh, that communion. Um, as far as Jewish chaplains is concerned, I don't know an awful lot about them because I've uh, I mostly stuck to Anglican ones, so I'm a bit hazy sometimes on nonconformists as well. Um, but um, as far as Jewish chaplains concerned, there weren't many of them, and they got around an awful lot. I've got a good friend who's done an awful lot of work on this that I've listened to um, speak in conferences. They just had to move around that battlefield very quickly in order to get places, in order to do the, the Jewish ceremonies. And they, but they also had a lot more lay help. They were, they were willing to give things over to lay, lay Jewish people so that they could get on with it when they weren't there. And that's about the limit of my knowledge, I'm afraid. No, no worries. That, that's, um, thanks very much for that. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'll go to Mark next. I know Richard's there, but Mark, I don't, I don't know if you've got a video working there Mark. Um, Mark can you uh, unmute yourself? Okay I'll come back to Mark's question in a moment. I, I'll need to fish Mark's question out of the list I've got. So instead I'm going to go now directly to Richard. Um, Richard you're now live or you, if you just unmute yourself you'll be, you'll be live. Richard fire away. Thank you for an illuminating talk, Linda. One of my relatives had the distinction, if it is a distinction, of being buried somewhere around K Trench on the way up to Pozier Heights by Chaplain Second Class Lieutenant Colonel Walter Ernest Dexter, DSO, MC, DCM, mentioned in dispatches twice, MA, Australia's most decorated chaplain. He won his DCM in South Africa, the, the DSO in Gallipoli, mm. MC in France. Charles Bean wrote of Dexter at Pozier, on one corner and one road near here, 50 yards away, is Major Dexter's coffee station, with, presumably with, two men on watch all day and night to give coffee to anybody who wants it, and a policeman to stop stragglers. Do you know whether Dexter had Studerts Kennedy's exceptional wartime popularity and pastoral qualities? Um, I have heard of, of, of Dexter because I'm writing about some chaplains in Gallipoli, so that's the context I've come, uh, I've come into him. But from what you're saying, I think it's pretty certain that he probably did. Um, it sounds to me from your description of him that he had probably all the right attributes to be a, a, a very popular chaplain. And some of the things, um, I'm trying to remember what, what, what I found out about him when he was in Gallipoli. Um, I can see his face now because I just I was just looking at a picture of him the other day uh, when I was going back and looking at Gallipoli. So um, I've got a picture of him. 
Um, and I forgot what the original question was. Oh yes, was he? Was he like? Yes, I, 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 from what you've said of him, I'm sure he probably was. If he could, you know, he seems to have that pastoral, um, uh, pastoral thing, giving out tea. However, chaplains have been criticised for giving out tea. Um, you know, instead of perhaps doing their spiritual things, but that's part of the whole sort of um, the whole argument of their role and things like that. Um, yes, so I think he probably was, but I don't know. I have definitely heard of him. He was very famous as a chaplain in Gallipoli. Thanks for that, Linda. And I've got a picture, question. so we've got a picture. Th th thanks for your question there, Richard. Uh, I'm going to go back to Mark um, now, um, whose question, uh, I think Mark, Mark can't poss possibly can to um, unmute himself. So, so Mark Goodwill asks this, uh, given the close working relationship with serious injury, death and bereavement, did the experience cause many padres to question their faith? Right, so this is a big one. <laughs> no, it is a deep one. Yeah, yes, um, yes, it, it did. Um, I've come across, when looking at the Church Times in the post-war years, come across one or two uh, instances where former Padres have actually committed suicide. Uh, there was a book out not long ago uh, called The Ch oh, Chaplain Who Lost His Faith or something like that, which is rather misleading because in the end he got it back. It was a description of how he had struggled with his, his faith. Um, it's difficult to say. I haven't come across a vast, uh, you know, uh, um, looking at post-war chaplains, which I've looked at quite a lot of chaplains in the in the 20s and 30s, I haven't come across um, a, a vast amount of evidence that they lost in faith. In fact, I've come more to the evidence they came back wanting to change Britain, wanted to change society, wanted to change the church. You know, they felt this given the impetus to, to go ahead and, um, and, and do things. Um, yeah, so I think probably I have, as I just said, I got these few incidents of suicides. Um, some went off and didn't carry on in parochial ministry. They went off and did different things, but uh, which is not necessarily evidence of losing one's faith. Uh, so on the whole, I would say the evidence I've got mainly is they came back rejuvenated, wanting to change the world. Th th thanks for that. Th thanks for the question. I I've just realised that Francis who's I've put up there on the screen, doesn't have a microphone, so uh, apologies Francis for putting your name up there, but Francis's question is as follows. Um, she, she starts off by saying, great talk Linda, was there any difference in approach between different denominations when it came to accepting bravery awards? Oh, accepting them or being given them? I wonder. Uh, yeah. Francis says accepting bravery was, but if you want to answer a different question, by all means. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't, think I, I don't think I can answer either of them, really. Um, because, um, you, that was, I, I must admit, I shouldn't have put that question up as the last one. because I, no, I, 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 I think, no, um, because uh, I mean, I've, I've done a bit of bit on Anglican Bravery Awards and um, I'm sure that nonconformists had probably, probably know in the army, probably be about the same proportion, very carefully worked out the same proportion of Bravery Awards. But I can't think of any reason offhand why they would have had difficulty accepting them unless they were being really rebellious and anti-establishment and, you know, we don't want your award, thank you very much. But I haven't come across anything like that in terms of Anglican ones or, or non-conformist ones. No, no worries. I, I think we've just probably just about um, um, got through all ah. the <laughs> questions here. Yes, uh, I, I think Good. what we'll do is, is, is call that call that a day. So uh, Linda, uh, sincere thanks uh, indeed for um, your talk and for fielding um, some pretty uh, good questions there, um, pretty, pretty deep ones there, so uh, thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, and on, on behalf of everybody here, uh, sincere thanks uh, for your presentation oh, tonight. Thank you for having me. <laughs> thank very much. Yeah. And uh, everybody, if you want to come along till the next um, talk, which is going to be um, back by popular demand, uh, Fraser Skiro uh, on on Monday evening at eight pm. So uh, hopefully we'll see everybody uh, at, at eight pm on Monday for um, Fraser's second talk. Um, and in the meantime, have a good weekend, everybody. Um, even though it's only Thursday, but thank you and good night, everybody. Oh.